Hello, BookTube. I have a free-floating mail hall here uh, that I thought we'd go through. It's sizable, so I didn't want to open it on my own. And I was uh, I was setting up the camera function on the MacBook and suddenly realized, aren't you wearing the exact same sweatshirt that you've worn in the last, like, 90 videos? <laughs> These people are going to think you that you never change it. And then I thought, no, oh, well, I don't ever change it. <laughs> I'm an old man who spends his entire life reading on his bed. <laughs> so so, so uh, if you could put up with yet more red sweatshirt. Let's go on to this mail and see what's here. Uh, it's a bunch of manila envelopes and it ends in a couple of boxes. So let's let's see what we have here. Uh, the, the, it's the post office, um, I think, working extra hard, as they always tend to do at the holidays in this country. I don't know why the post office in this country gets such a bad rap. Uh, okay, this comes out in January. It's a finished copy, comes out in January from Harvard. It's Indian Captive, Indian King. Uh, in 1758, Peter Williamson appeared on the streets of Aberdeen, Scotland, dressed as a Native American and telling a remarkable tale. He claimed that as a young boy he had been kidnapped from the city and sold into slavery in America. In performances and in printed narrative he peddled his to his audience, Williamson described his tribulations as an indentured servant, Indian captive, soldier, and prisoner of war. Aberdeen's magistrates called him a liar and banished him from the city, but Williamson defended his story. Huh. So this is a study of that. This is a study of that phenomenon. Okay. Uh, I don't think I ever got an advanced copy of this. This would be that's that's fascinating though. Uh, okay, so I don't know where I'm gonna put all this stuff. That that's number one. Uh, obscure footnote in colonial era history. That uh, oh, the next one is uh, Europa Press, that's always nice. Uh, they do such good work. This comes out also in January. Very good. I need all the January books I can get. This is by Alessandro Barbaro. It's called The Athenian Woman. Uh, what have we got here? Historical fiction, maybe? Oh, yes. <laughs> Athens, 411 B.C. Uh, in the countryside, Thrasyllus and Polymon, two veterans of the infamous Battle of Manatea, now live in adjacent cottages as humble farmers. They are determined to improve their lot by finding influential husbands for their daughters, Glycera and Charis. However, sensing that a violent political scheme is secretly afoot, the two friends agree that first they must defend Athens from oligarchs who are plotting to reinstate tyrannical rule. Meanwhile, the daughters are convinced their fathers are being paranoid and impatient, set about finding suitors for themselves. Oh, while this romantic drama plays out in the countryside, from the stage, the Athenian Lysistrata and the Spartan Lampito raise their voices in protest against misogyny and war, calling into question the status quo the Athenians have accepted for centuries. Alessandro Barbaro captures an Athens that feels extraordinary, extraordinarily contemporary. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a full-dress ancient world historical novel that I did not know was coming. The Athenian women. Uh, fantastic. Okay, that's that's two in a row that are sort of in my wheelhouse that I didn't know were coming. But that bodes well for the rest of this, this mail haul. Let's, let's see if they're all equally interesting. Uh, well, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is from Yale. This comes out in January as well. This is the finished copy. Uh, it's by Michael Walzer, and it's called A Foreign Policy for the Left. Uh, foreign policy for leftists, the author asserts, used to be relatively simple. They were for the breakdown of capitalism and its replacement with a centrally planned economy. They were for workers against moneyed interests and for colonized people against imperial Western powers. But these easy substitutes for thought... <laughs> they're substitutes for thought, are they? And everyone who's ever believed in them was substituting for thinking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> are becoming increasingly difficult. Yes, <laughs> they're becoming increasingly difficult because 40% of the world's wealth is now held by 3% of the world's population. That wasn't true. <laughs> Neoliberal capitalism is triumphant, and the workers' movement is in radical decline. National liberation movements have produced new oppressions. A reflexive anti-imperialist politics can turn leftists into apologists for morally abhorrent groups. Any guesses? Which groups this writer has in mind? <laughs> I think I can probably think of two or three right off the top of my head. I'll check the index and see if I'm right. Uh, 
Okay, so in the author's view, the left can no longer, in fact, could never take knee-jerk positions but must proceed from clearly articulated moral principles. And it never did. It never did proceed from those principles. Goodness gracious. What a shock that will be <laughs> to, to, uh, to all the uh, people who are still alive who structured modern-day leftist politics. <laughs> what a shock it will be to them to learn that they only were operating uh, knee-jerk reactions and never actually thought out anything. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Somebody tell President Carter. Somebody tell Michael Dukakis. <laughs> okay. Great. All right. So a rabble-rousing political tract, also for January. Uh, all right. Uh, let's, let me shift over just a bit here so these things don't catapult off the floor. And let's barrel on. This is uh, certainly interesting. Uh Oh, look at this. Okay. All right. This is, It's starting to look like uh, academic presses are, are, uh, are getting their January stuff out probably in mass before they all leave for holiday. Uh, and this is a finished copy from Harvard of, uh, of something that I didn't get in the advanced copy. Uh, and I'm glad to have it because it's, uh, it's a subject that really interests me. This is another January book. Uh, this is by Nir Ariel. Ariely, and it is from Byron to Bin Laden, a history of foreign war volunteers. <laughs> Gotta love that title. Uh, what makes people fight and risk their lives for countries other than their own? Why did diverse individuals such as Lord Byron, George Orwell, Che Guevara, and Osama Bin Laden all volunteer for ostensibly foreign causes? The author helps us understand this perplexing phenomenon with a wide-ranging history of foreign war volunteers from the wars of the French Revolution to the Civil War in Syria. Okay. All right. Uh, fantastic. Okay. Uh, God bless the academic presses. I always say that on this channel. I always mean it, too. So, uh, let's see what we have next here. It's from One World Press. I can always tell because they include a cute little note. And, uh, and they put their publicity sheets wrapped around the book on the outside. Okay, so this... This comes out in May, uh, and what have we got here? Uh, the Aviator by Eugene Vodolazkin. Oh, the author of Loris. He wrote Loris, a beautiful uh, book that was actually really good, too. I loved it. Uh, a young man wakes up in a hospital bed with no idea who he is or how he came to be there. The only information the doctor shares with his patient before urging him to write down every thought and feeling that comes to his mind is his name. Inotke Petrovich Platonov. As Inotke, as Inokenti, Inokenti, uh, sorry, sorry, if the author is going to give him such a ham handedly telegraphic name, I should get it right. Inokenti. Uh, as he writes, he begins to build a vivid picture of his former life as a young man in Russia in the early 20th century. Through the turbulence of the Russian Revolution and its aftermath, soon only one question remains. How can he remember the start of the 20th century when the bills, the pills by his bedside were made in 1999? Reminiscent of the great works of 20th century Russian literature, with nods to crime and punishment and the white guard, the aviator cements the author's position as the rising star of the Russian literary scene. Uh, wow, I wonder what, uh, I wonder what he, his life is like. Uh, do, we, do we actually have... Uh, anything about him? Does he actually live in Russia? He's born in Kiev and worked in the Department of Old Russian Literature at Pushkin House since 1990. He's an expert in medieval Russian history and folklore. Loris was his first novel to be translated into English and won great acclaim. It was talked about everywhere. And he lives in St. Petersburg. Okay, so this is this is a, an a author of literary fiction who's being translated into English on a relatively contemporaneous basis and whose books are well regarded in the in the western english speaking book market who lives in Putin's Russia and presumably goes to uh, literary events and whatnot i don't actually know i don't i still don't know really how to look at my google analytics so i don't know if any of you are actually watching me from russia uh, i i get the impression no but i'd love to know uh what your impression of what his life must be like? What is his life like? I, I, uh, I mean, I read and really liked Loris, and I am very familiar. I read a lot of uh, Soviet literature, literature that was produced under the Soviet rule. 
And you could see the censor hands all over it. You could see, you could tell that it was state-approved literature. And I didn't get that impression at all with this guy's, the first book of his that I read in English. And I wonder if I'm going to get that impression with this book either. But then, then if that's true, then I don't know what the relationship is between an obviously successful author of literary fiction in modern-day Russia and the Russian government. I don't know what that relationship is, if there is one. Uh, I should probably dig into that and find out. Um... Anyway, that, that sounds fascinating. Now we move on. We've got uh, cardboard to finish up this weird free-floating mail hall. The uh, first one is uh, a thin thing. I'm guessing, uh, since just by the drift of what we've had so far, this will probably be uh, the finished copy of another book from another academic press. Uh, that seems to be what I'm getting this time around. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> No, it's not. Oh my God! It's <laughs> it's the Sparschalt affair. Look at that! Oh, it's the lovely embossed Sparschalt affair in the non-American version. How very nice! I ordered this with the book depository, and the book depository said it'll be dispatched in four days. I thought, great, that's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> but when they dispatch it, it turned out is not a reflection of when you get what you order, as many of you chimed in and told me. Book Deposit takes its own sweet time getting you the book, which is why the shipping is free. Uh, I wasn't prepared for that. I actually kind of like it. Now that I know that it actually works, uh, great. So I have the Sparshold Affair in an edition that I actually want to keep. Uh, fantastic. Okay. Uh, and then we've got another box. I won't make any predictions about it, since I was wrong about that last one. Uh, oh, what have we here? Oh, we have Angry Robot Science Fiction. Uh, two books this time around. Uh, first one is by James Moore. It is a Tides of War novel uh, called Fallen Gods. It's book two. Uh, and I don't know that I have book one, so I, I'll just have to rely on this book to... Uh, to do what it's supposed to do. Uh, look at that cover, though. Isn't that, can you make out the details there? That is a very nice cover. That's the leg bone of a dead giant. There's the foot. The skeletal foot. Uh, Brogan McTyre and his compatriots are wanted, dead or alive. Preferably alive, so they can be sacrificed to the raging gods, whom they defied with catastrophic consequences. All they can do is round up more mercenaries and turn them into a fearsome army. But human warriors aren't enough when the gods bring Armageddon to the world, unleashing storms and madness and ceaseless attacks on Brogan's men by increasingly demonic foes. There is one chance, there's always one chance, uh, deep in the heart of the Broken Blades Mountain lies a sword containing the heart of a god slain in immortal combat, the one thing that might give Brogan an edge against the gods. But finding the lost weapon of a long-dead god isn't going to be easy. Okay. Uh, so this is Tides of War number number two, and I uh, I, I, don't, I don't recall volume one, so I'm going to just rely on the author to bring me up to speed. Uh, and did I say when this comes out? When, when, when have we got here for a date? Assuming next year. Yeah, January. Okay. And then the, this next one is also Angry Robot. It's also January. Uh, it's Queen of All Crows by Rod Duncan. Uh looks vaguely historical. Uh, the year is 2012, but it might as well be the Victorian age. The nations of the world are overseen by the International Patent Office and its ruthless stranglehold on technology. When airships start disappearing in the middle of the Atlantic, the Patent Office is desperate to discover what has happened. Forbidden to operate beyond the territorial waters of member nations, they, spend, they send spies to investigate in secret. One of those spies is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Barnabas, she must overcome her dislike of the machinations of her employers, disguise herself as a man, and take to the sea in search of the floating nation of pirates who threaten the world order. Okay, so it's alt-history, steampunky type thing. Uh, uh, that, and it's the first volume in a series. It's, it's the first volume in its series. Uh, okay. All right, so two science fiction fantasy books from, from Angry Robot. And then we have... Uh, a box with with stamps all over it, so it can't be it. Oh. It's another gift. <laughs> oh. oh, it's another gift. Uh. All right. 
As I said in an earlier video, I'm not completely sure where I stand with the rest of you sending me presents. <laughs> that that's, uh, seems like an inversion of the natural order. I'm the one who sends things. Uh, and plus, I've told you all over and over and over again, don't get me a book. Uh, just recently, <laughs> somebody solved that problem by getting me fudge. <laughs> um, there's a card. Uh, and then what have we got here? What, what is it this time around? Uh, uh, packing material? Okay, that's, that's padding material. Is there actually something in here? Uh, yes, there is. Oh. <laughs> Dog treats. <laughs> Oh my! Dog treats! <laughs> okay, that works! <laughs> uh, and then there's another one here. How wonderful! Frida is going to have a dog treat. She, uh, she had an incident earlier today. It was a classic puppy type thing. Classic spoiled child type thing of any species. She was, uh, she was on the floor here in the room and she was inching her way towards an electric wire. The wire to the space heater. And I was watching her the whole time, and I was saying, don't do that. Don't get any closer to that. You're not allowed to bite that. And finally, she opened her mouth, and I said, Frida, no. And she moved away from the wire and moved instantly to one of my shoes. And I said, no. <laughs> no, you can't play with that either. And she stomped down in between the electrical wire and the shoe with a totally dejected look on her face that said, I don't get anything. And she was, at that moment, on the floor, literally surrounded by toys. <laughs> it just wasn't the ones she wanted, and that was all that counted. But what have we got here? Oh, my. It's, it's a container of, uh, of uh, Vermont maple syrup. Hmm. Look at that. A little squirt nozzle up on the top. Uh... Okay, but well, okay, that's wonderful. But but how would I use it? How would I use this? I don't know how to make pancakes. Uh, is it permissible to pour Vermont maple syrup on on uh, just ordinary toast? <laughs> I'll have to Google it. <laughs> oh wow, wonderful. Well, that's incredible. Uh, okay, this is incredibly nice. All right, so we have uh, can't make a, I can't make a, a Steve pyramid out of non-book items. I have my limitations. So we have genuine Vermont maple syrup and two gourmet dog cookies that Frida is going to destroy, uh, and a wonderful card. Uh, and then we have our books. So let's let's see. Uh, after a long time waiting, we have the Sparshold Affair in this beautiful. Uh, UK trade paperback. Uh, we have The Aviator, uh, Russian fiction from a Russian, uh, a best-selling Russian author. Uh, from Byron to Bin Laden, a study of people who go and fight other people's wars. Uh, a foreign policy for the left, because it's high time they had one. <laughs> uh, the Athenian Women, uh, a historical novel that uh, is daring in that it takes place far away from uh from 5th century Athens. It takes place far away from the city. That's daring on the author's part. He must be completely confident that he can keep your interest without hauling on Pericles. Uh, and uh, Indian captive, Indian king, but a guy who uh, promulgated his own brand of fake news. Uh, and then Queen of All Crows and Fallen Gods, two science fiction fantasy novels from Angry Robot. Uh, so there we go. That is a kind of a free-floating mail haul as we as we wind our way down on the mail halls to the end of the year. <laughs> uh, and that'll be it for now, and I will see you soon. Uh, thank you, BookTube.